So for those of you not familiar with CBRE Global Investors, uh, we're one of the world's leading real asset investment managers. Um, across our global platform, which we've been building for more than 40 years, we have more than $100 billion worth of assets under management. Um, and within that, the UK accounts for about £12 billion uh, pounds worth across our direct, indirect and, and listed platforms. Uh, personally, within that, I lead the UK strategy and research team. So as well as overseeing all of the usual uh, research outputs, I coordinate our formulation of house views and investment strategies and uh, sit on the UK investment committee and oversight committee there as well. Um, our holdings across the UK, I would say, uh, yeah, very broad across all sectors and all of the, the major cities. Um, if anything, probably a house which has had, over the long run, a bit of a bias away from London and towards the regional cities. So, really interesting topic today. Okay, great. Robin. So, Robin Hutchison from um, Naveen, um, which is obviously now a trillion dollar uh, global entity. Um, personally, I work on the Janice Henderson UK property PAFE, which is um, it's a mandate we run for Janice Henderson here upstairs, conveniently. Um, it is an open-ended, daily traded uh, retail fund. And when I say retail, I'm not talking about the sector, more retail investment um, or investors. So we in invest across the UK, all geographies, um, asset classes and sectors, um, but daily traded. So high demand on liquidity, often in the press, which I'm sure will probably get questioned on. Um, but yeah, that's day to day from my perspective. Great, Jessica. Thank you. Good afternoon. So Jessica Hardman, um, I head up the uh, UK group for DWS. DWS is also a global asset manager in real estate. Um, maybe taking a look at Europe, we're around 25 billion euros under management. And my role is to run the UK business, which has a collection of pan-European and global funds and separate accounts. Um, all of those accounts are investing in the UK. We are quite a big buyer of London, um, but we also have significant holdings in the other big six cities, and that's where we probably stop from an international capital source. Um, so very interested to talk more about our views on the UK and how that's positioned in Europe. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name's Tom Leahy. I work for Real Capital Analytics. Um, unlike my fellow panellists, uh, we're not an investor in real estate. We are a data and analytics business, so... We're a global business. Any, anywhere a property investment transaction happens, we aim to capture it and it goes into our database and then we feed that data back to our clients. So we have, I think, 1,200 clients around the world, all active in some aspect of real estate investment, financing, brokering, et cetera, et cetera. Great, Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Sim. I'm the managing partner of Europa Capital. We are another investment management business, uh, pan-European. We run both um, closed-ended and open-ended core funds as well as debt. So we are a, both, both a lender and a, an equity investor. We are part of a bigger group, um, part owned by Mitsubishi Estates, which is one of the largest um, real estate listed companies in the world. Um, so we're part of, uh, I guess, an investment house which has $70 billion under management. Our focus in Europe is dominated by the UK, France, and Germany. Um, probably in our in most of our funds, we are probably at least a third in the UK. Um, again, probably quite a broad uh, investment spectrum, both in terms of debt and equity, all sectors, but quite a strong bias towards residential. Um, and that can be from land promotion to PRS and build to rent. So let's, uh, let's start with you, Rob, if we can. Um, just in terms of the capital sources, obviously we're looking here at the capital flows as well. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the, the sort of sources, equity raising, which investors are more active? Um, are there particular strategies that are gathering more capital in terms of UK opportunities particularly? So our, um, our UK focus funds are student housing and debt. I think it would be safe to say that raising money for UK focused funds at the moment is probably harder than pan-European um, and that's probably for obvious reasons which I'm sure we'll come on to later. Uh, interestingly enough um, for value add um, Europe including the UK is still of interest we are um, actively marketing our, our next fund and actually have got very good traction with with investors who who like the opportunity and, and I think one of the things again we may talk about is th the fact that the UK is moving maybe in a slight at a slightly different pace to to the rest of Europe 
um, which probably for a value add investor makes it interesting. For core, it's maybe a, a, a little more challenging. Okay, good. And is it? Does anybody else have a view on that? Feel free to, to come in. Um, that will be that will be Team One's um, one, and you're you're in the middle, Jessica. So take whichever one is nearest to you. That's probably the easiest. Um, if you've got any other pers different perspectives on that, well, actually, it's it's sort of to to support that point. I would say that what we're seeing from, um, especially from uh, continental European capital sources, is that they. They're a little bit hesitant around the UK because of the political uncertainty, but still prepared to come when they can see what they would consider to be more of a structural than a cyclical story. So it comes to potentially things like student accommodation, but where I can think of um, examples recently would be around affordable housing and around, around healthcare. So those alternatives still attractive to, to international capital. Um, and does that, I mean, let's... let's Let's look at that a little bit more, um, because you launched a, an affordable housing fund recently, um, or relatively recently, I think. Um, so is that, is that, I mean, that's a trend across Europe, actually, interestingly. So is that picking up um, really residential, or is that picking up affordable uh, housing as a specific part of that? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So that, that fund is specifically affordable housing in the UK across the different affordable tenures, but it does tap into the, to the wider trend that we're seeing in the UK and right across Europe, more investor interest in residential playing into big trends such as um, urbanisation and people's preference for access over ownership to an extent now. So it is playing into that big um, European piece. I think why we like it in the UK more than maybe build to rent, for example, is just that build to rent is quite is quite new in the UK still. We're still looking for a bit more track record, perhaps. I think it's it's definitely an interesting area, an area where there's strong interest, and that's going to continue. Um, I just think right now maybe it's not for for everyone. The other interesting side to the affordable housing is that it it plays into the ESG agenda, which is really which is really um, more and more on investors' minds at the moment to provide a real estate product that can um, demonstrate a positive social impact. I mean, it's interesting picking up, and that also came out very strongly, I think, in, in the two presentations, but also in the discussions we've been having. It's been very interesting to note the change in terms of uh, the importance of wellness, the importance of human capital, those kinds of things. I mean, for sure, I mean, we did some, we did a, a session which was on wellness at MIPIM this year, um, and that would have that would have just not been practical at all, even the year before. I don't think I don't think anybody would have really thought about that. Um, and we're actually doing one in uh, Warsaw at the CE summit again because there's suddenly an interest in in those areas. Um, uh, I'll tackle this now. I mean, Jessica, is that something that's um, driving everything? Do you think more of this sort of drive towards livability in terms of the cities when you're looking at them? Um, what are you like looking at in terms of making it an attractive area for you to want to invest or for your capital to want to invest? Yeah, so I think um, building on upon the urbanisation theme that was mentioned um, we have a, a very strong um, strategy around investing in emerging locations, and those are around um, major conurbations across Europe, but including the UK. So by way of an example, we have um, invested significant capital in Stratford. We like Stratford because we see a big residential um, unit growth there. We like it because the infrastructure is improving. It's also got some great um, social amenities from the Olympic Games and, it, and actually a lot of inward investment from the government as well. So for us, it's an all singing location and, and a really great blueprint to modern um, uh, urbanization and placemaking across Europe. I think it's actually one of the best examples across Europe to be invested in. So for us, playing into the affordable residential, also a key theme for us, together with emerging location is, is very important. Moving on to then how does that um, uh, help us e expand our investment with e an ESG lens on, uh, which is also another big area and absolutely right, governments, investors, tenants, man on the street and investment managers are all very, very focused now. And I think the UK is really um, helping lead that way across um, as you go through, east through um, Europe. I think you're seeing uh, still 
immature markets in terms of ESG. And then you're looking at the Netherlands and the UK as, as leaders in this space. That's so great, great to be here and, and experiencing that. But very much for us, we are looking at some of those big investment strategies like affordable accommodation, but also re-looking at our existing portfolios and implementing how we can really drive energy and water efficiency and work with our tenants around building communities as well. So it's both at the sort of macro level guiding our investment strategy and at the micro level actually looking at the assets themselves and how are we really getting best performance from an investment perspective but also from an E and an S perspective too. Okay, good. Um, Tom, I, I just wanted to pick up with you um, looking, at the, looking at the capital flows. Um, I mean, we'll move to, to a sort of forward look, but what are you seeing in terms of, I mean, and let's say, I've waited 10 minutes so I can use the word Brexit, I think, we're, we're 10 minutes in, I think that's allowed. Um, what have you seen? Have you seen a particular change um, since the referendum result up until now? Is there a movement in terms of the types of capital um, or, or even the sort of sectors that they're particularly favouring? Um, I think sort of two ways of looking at this. It's kind of a, a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty. I mean, the market has certainly changed since the Brexit referendum. Um, I mean, 2015 was the peak in the UK in terms of, of total property investment volumes and the market has slowed somewhat since. Um, but actually, we, we've had sort of four four years with actually relatively strong investment. You know, last year we recorded £59 billion pounds worth of deals uh, in the UK real estate market, which made it, I think it was just second, just pipped to second place uh, behind Germany as the biggest market in Europe. Um, this year, there's definitely been a slowing, but it's still ahead of Germany in terms of total investment volumes. So yes, the market has changed. The nature of the capital has also changed. So for example, in London, we saw a big influx of money coming from Hong Kong straight after the vote, motivated primarily, it seems, by uh, falling the value of the pound. And those investors have been very active in the very large lot sizes. Now that kind of baton was picked up by some of the South Korean investors last year. So they were very, very large uh, players in the central London market, but they seem to have switched attentions to Paris. Um, so we've, we've had two pretty slow quarters for UK investment, I think, in the run-up to, well, as a result of, I guess, the postponement of the Brexit, leaving date at the end of March, and some of the uncertainty that's, that's going around um, with the Conservative leadership election and, and the run-up to the next date of October the 31st. So I think there's certainly a bit of a wait-and-see approach. I mean, in the city... Um, this quarter, or Q2 in the city, was the worst ever. So I think, well, depending on whose numbers you, you believe, if, if it's ours, it's the worst quarter since 2009. Someone else is saying worst quarter ever. But it's certainly very slow. Now, there's one argument that that's a supply-driven slowdown, that people are actually not bringing their assets to market so, and that there are demand is there. I was at another um, of our clients um, on Monday who are a major owner of central London real estate, and the quote to me was, the market's dead at the moment. So I think there is, there is a bit of a, a wait and see approach going on. Okay, that's good. Um, and um, and uh, Robin, I mean, you, you mentioned it there that uh, after the election there had to be, you know, th that because of the nature of the fund, um, you therefore got to sell at, at given points. Um, I mean, I don't need to concentrate on that so much, but I'd be interested, was it difficult to find buyers? What, does it, does, what, what was the flow of capital? Was it, um, was it South Koreans? Was, it, you know, was there a broad um, breadth, I suppose, of capital? And was that split between those looking at London and looking at the regions? Or you know, did you, what, I suppose, was the makeup of, of, of that capital? Um, I mean, 2016, as widely publicised, was quite a difficult time for, for open-ended retail funds. So, I mean... Being, it's been widely in the press, but we sold circa a billion pounds of property in in a uh, hundred days across thirty three assets, and the breadth of those um, of buyers was 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 global. Um, you know, we carry a we we tend to weight heavily towards London for liquidity purposes because it is there's always a depth of buyers, um, and when you need that liquidity, they tend to transact fairly swiftly. Um, so, typical buyers in London at that point in time were the usual suspects. Um, yeah, Germany, Chinese, uh, Asia Pacific, etc. Um, you know, we did see that actually. You go to the regions; there was mainly domestic buyers, but you were seeing uh, overseas buyers moving up that risk curve and and moving to regional locations, which was quite interesting at the point in time. Um, in the current cycle, I think there is still depth and liquidity in the market, but 
buyers are certainly more educated now, overseas buyers, um, and whilst their investment hypothesis has changed, altered, and they've, it's brought in logistics, for example, um, you know, and many overseas buyers have now partnered with asset managers, whether they're small scale boutique in, in, in the UK, um, you know, the, those small asset managers are doing the underwrite on more risky acquisitions. So um, I think the liquidity is still there, but it's very specific uh, and aspect, asset specific, which is making it harder. Okay, good. Um, and uh, and Rob, obviously, with seed capital from Mitsubishi and some of the funds, are you? I mean, not all capital has the same view, plainly. Um, but there's been an expectation for at least two years now that there's going to be a huge amount of Japanese capital coming into the market at some point. Um, how do you how do you see that? And are there are there particular things in terms of the strategy from that capital in in terms of in terms of your funds? So we have, um, obviously Mitsubishi is a shareholder and as a co-investor in, in, in a lot of our funds, but also we have a number of um, relatively small amounts of Japanese investment in, in some of those products. Um, they are incredibly conservative. They are incredibly rigorous, um, as most Asian investors are. They are educating themselves, which has taken a long time. So I don't think they will rush in um, perhaps like Chinese and Korean investors there, they they use um, gatekeepers both in Japan and in Europe, and they use different gatekeepers for different products. So um, I think there are maybe a lot of agents in the world who think that they can just go and try and market you know, a, a shiny office building in a, a big European city and they'll get a Japanese investor to buy it. That, that just will never happen because they don't want to embarrass them themselves and there is an awful lot of um, politics involved. Most Japanese investors know each other. It's a very big country, but actually there is an awful lot of interrelationships between um, a lot of the pension funds and investors. And, and is there a difference in view between longer term capital, I suppose more patient capital, in terms of looking at the UK? Tom obviously mentioned there that there's a pause, whether that's a pause because of lack of supply. But is there a change in the view of, of funds in terms of the types of capital looking at, at, at the UK? They, um, they like the US. So in, in a sense, it's they've been investing in the US in you know, probably quite actively and uh, and that's changed i think that's changed because they view the us market as um basically fully priced and also i think there are impacts on um f fx and tax that they struggle with which actually has made europe more interesting which is kind of sad i think they they struggled with europe they think europe is quite unsophisticated and complicated and why would they ever invest there given that they are probably more core buyers than, than value add investors? Um, I think that's changed. Mitsubishi have been investing in London for 25 years. They are a developer at heart, so they they like to do that and they're generally quite long-term holders, but they, they want an income distribution. You've got to understand they, they've grown up in a world where if you started working 25 years ago, you've probably never seen a, your salary go up or had a bonus. They, they live in a world where there is you know, no inflation, you know, no interest rates, and therefore to explain to them that there is rental growth and, and all of that is, is, is challenging. They, they find it hard to underwrite those sorts of assumptions. Okay, good. Jessica, you want to pick that yeah, up? Yeah, just... Well, I was yeah, okay. Um, I was just going to um, build on that, actually, uh, Rock. I think you made some really good, interesting um, comments there. But I, I would also say that from a Japanese pers uh, perspective, don't, often they might not come in at the direct real estate stage. So, uh, much like Europa, one of our strategic partners um, from our IPO last year was Nippon Life. Now, so they're, they're investing in an invest investment manager that is exposed to alternative real estate as, as well as um, the fixed income markets as well. So, it, it's just sometimes maybe that's where they're at at the moment. Eventually, you will see more dynamic capital into it directly into um, real estate. But also, you know, maybe the European economy, UK economy is looking 
more like a German, uh, sorry, a Japanese economy, a lower for longer, a low interest rate environment. Maybe this will actually add the similarities that they were looking for rather than the more cyclical markets that, that we're more used to in some of our big cities in, in the UK and, and in Europe. So so I probably uh, you know, have some optimism we will see some Japanese capital come in. It may not be for the next 12, 24 months, but I think there's a preparation and also an appreciation of what a European market might offer them, and, and UK is obviously a strong component of that post, um, post the disruption politically that we're going through now. Um, and um, Rachel obviously there mentioned German capital as being a big component part of um, of the, the sort of investment coming into Liverpool. Um, what's your sense, obviously um, DWS, a lot of German capital uh, at the base of that. Um, uh, and German capital actually came quite heavily into into the UK post Brexit as well post Brexit referendum result. Um, what's the what's the view What's the view there? Um, is there you know is there a, a sort of quantified view from Germany if you like that you're seeing? Yeah. So. I, I, I I think we look there on a pan-European basis. It happens that we have a lot of German capital, but our strategy isn't different for German capital than it is for Asian capital. Of course, they may be seeking different returns. But but the German um, capital base and funds, like UK, like the fact it has a different cycle to Germany, the fact that it has a major conurbation like London and, and you know similar to Paris versus Germany, which has the, the five big cities. So it has different dynamics, um, which I think complement what might be a German and have a portfolio or one with uh, you know other European locations as well. Um, and I think it a little bit depends on discretionary and non-discretionary capital. Our discretionary funds are open to look at London regardless of this disruption. They are long-term investors. They see the relevance of London and, and the UK, and this includes our big acquisitions in Manchester, etc., um, as long-term holds. And this is a you know, a disruption of of 24, 20, you know, 36 months or, you know, eat my words perhaps on that. But, you know, it's something that's short term when you're running a fund that's been going for 40 years. So I think very much they are open and looking and maybe taking advantage of the fact there's slightly less buyers um, or, um, you know, vendors want more conversations around their assets rather than open market profiles. So, so I think we look at that non-discretionary capital. It's a bit harder. You know, they are, are cautious. That might be German or Asian capital cautious. How do they write an investment paper and, and support the uh, you know, investing in a disruptive period? Uh, we have to work a little bit, a bit harder on that. But again, some of them see the opportunity to perhaps be higher up that bid list than they once were when, you know, the whole world was investing in, in London and, and the UK. So you know, it depends a little bit on the end investor or product. But, um, you know, our transaction team in the UK are busy. So I'd say that's a pretty good barometer. Okay, good. Um, and Robin, just just um, obviously it's not in, it's your, not a detailed part of yours, but at Nuveen, obviously there's um, you know you've got a very big mixed use um, development in Edinburgh. Um, what's the sort of sense of, of London versus regional regional cities from a sort of overall perspective when within the various funds? Um, I mean. Nuveen is a business in the UK invests across um, multi jurisdictions. So, um, Edinburgh St James is a huge development for the for the business. Um, you know, it's it's 650 million GDV. So, kind of a one off to a certain extent. Um, whereas on the flip side, we have the European Cities Fund that is, you know, it's it's a research led uh, piece based on thematics and and they've gone through a process identifying cities within Europe that they deem will outperform over a longer term time horizon so that was 28 cities um some have some have dropped out i won't name which uh, and others have, have have moved into that that model um you know they've invested again in edinburgh um birmingham a number of the big six within the uk they're now overweight to the uk so they're looking more at europe um you know but it is in it's europe is a very competitive market um yeah, as is the UK to a certain extent in certain sectors, but Europe as a whole is difficult um, to acquire, and you're competing with people who, who um, whose return profiles or the returns they'll accept are significantly lower um, than a than a fund like ECF that has to distribute a net a net return uh, to investors that's agreed. So it's difficult. I think um, I think London will continue to hold up, and we still will always seek to invest in London. For off for the for the PAFE over the regions purely on a liquidity basis, um, 
notwithstanding that, we have invested in the majority of the big six regions because we, we understand and, and appreciate those sub-markets and what they can deliver, um, which used to be a bit more yield, not so much at the moment when you look at um, the net issue yields being paid in Manchester or Birmingham, for example. Um, but we also accept that the regions, um, Manchester, Cambridge being prime examples where they retain um, university students. And I think whether it's in London or the sub-markets of London or um, locations across the UK where there's this war for talent, we're seeing if you can retain um, university students and you've got the, the quantum of employable staff there who are well-educated, you attract businesses and ultimately you're going to attract in with investment. Um, that's case in point why Cambridge has done so well, really, um, even through the GFC and Manchester is, is, is booming, really. Okay, good. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Thank you for those coming on Slido. So I'm going to I'm going to try and filter. There's a couple for you, Sean, that I'll come to in a second. Um, but one of them is particularly on um, impact investing. Um, is that something that there's a demand for? I mean, Edinburgh St James, in a way, could be could be seen as that. Um, is that something that the the capital is looking for? Is that something that investment managers are looking for because they see it as a more sustainable investment? Or um, does anyone have a view on that? From my perspective, um, having been through the, the launch of a real estate fund which puts itself out there as a, as a social impact fund, uh, I would say that the, the demand from various investor groups has been, has been very strong. It's been from our sort of traditional um, UK investor base, but also from from European investors, and like I say, from some European investors who would consider the conventional property types to be off their radar at the moment, but would still look to go into this area. And then, um, actually, um, social impact investors themselves, those houses who are specifically looking for social impact investments, uh, are, have come to the fund and are investing in real estate through that way. So I think it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of demand there, and I think that that will increase. Tom, maybe coming to you, I want to look a little bit at the sectors. Um, in terms of the sectors, what have, what have you been seeing? I mean, obviously, we heard a lot there about things related to innovation, but also residential. Um, is that what you're seeing coming through in terms of the, the focus of, of the investments? Uh, yes, absolutely, yes. So uh, back in I think 2006, seven apartment residential investment was around 1% of the UK market. Um, last year it was 12% and as a percentage it's, it's only going one way, so it keeps, it keeps going up. Conversely, regional, uh, sorry, sorry, not regional, retail, retail investment was about a quarter of the market in 2006, seven, so the peak of the last property boom. It's now down at between 10 and 12%. So, at some point, uh, retail and sort of residential investment are going to cross over. They already have on a sort of Europe-wide basis, but they will do in the UK. Um, and you know, there's very clear reasons for that. That I mean, I guess we we can touch on about the the structural headwinds facing the retail sector. You know, our um, we produce a property price indices. It's based on actual transaction prices, um, and unfortunately, the UK big six retail market, so that's the, the retail sector out in the major UK regional cities, is uh, the worst performing since 2007 of, I think, the 300 indices we cover, or we, we produce. Um, so that tells you this, you know, I, I guess this, the, 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 the nature of the problem that has affected the retail market um, in the UK. Um, London's a different story though, you know, pricing in London is still, is, is rocketed way above its previous peak. Um, and then moving, you know, the, the kind of flip side of that is obviously what's happening in the warehouse sector. You know, UK warehousing has been one of the best performing uh, property sectors in terms of price growth that we cover. You know, we've seen 10 to 12 percent per annum growth in, in prices for UK warehousing. And that's a part of the market that, you know, everyone wants to be in. I was talking to uh, someone who's raising funds for, for Prologis and he, you know, they've got a queue a mile long to get into their funds at the moment. So that's clearly a, a trend that is 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 ongoing. Um, that shift to sort of bed. Some t someone characterised it to me the other day as beds, sheds, and meds. So apartment, student housing, senior housing, hotels, and warehousing very much in vogue. Okay, good. And is that what everybody else is seeing? Does anybody else have a more positive um, take on retail? Um, is it if you're being counter cyclical, the time to buy? 
Um, it's always a difficult one to find some, some good news for the retail sector, but like you say, um, opportunity, perhaps. Yes, I think one of the interesting things that you see when, when sentiment really shifts, especially around something which people call a, which people call a, call a secular change or a, a big shift happening, um, and it's all around e-commerce. So actually, if you go back a couple of years, uh, you saw the same thing the other way around with the industrial sector. So if we look at 2018, we were seeing what I would call some, some pretty irrational prices being paid for some pretty poor industrial assets. Some investors looking at the story of e-commerce, fully buying into that and assuming that this meant a new level of rental growth was sustainable into the future for all industrial assets, not differentiating enough. And now what we're seeing is the reverse of that with retail, where it does seem like that negative sentiment is being equally priced across all types of assets. And although we can't maybe see it now, give it another 12 or 24 months, and we will see that there are still plenty of retail locations out there that are sustainable, where there still will be strong demand. And uh, there will be opportunities now if, if some of those come to market, and uh, they could like, look like very wise moves once this sort of peak fear period is over. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I, yeah, I tend to ag agree with that. We, we've been less than agnostic about retail probably in the UK and across Europe for, for the last 12, 18 months. We, we still like retail warehousing, but actually particularly bulky goods retail warehousing. I think we're, we're concerned about fashion retail generally other than in probably destinations and in, in, you have know, strong high streets in, in, in major cities, which we generally can't buy because we're, you know, the returns are too low anyway. Um, the question I have about you know, logistics and warehousing is actually you know, technology has just disrupted, in my view, retail and retailers earlier than everything else. Um, you could say that the the rise of WeWork is just technology disrupting offices. And I, and I do think there there may be a case that in the logistics sector, um, how how margins are going to get squeezed by distributors because you know, we're all sending 75% of what we buy back to them and they're having to store it somewhere. You know, how sustainable is that model? And whether that's a, whether the ethics of, of that start impacting and therefore impacting on how much space and what sort of rents they have to pay, you know, maybe should be borne in mind rather than just thinking that you know, another 500,000 square foot shed on a, on a motorway hub is, is going to work for the next 25 years when you might have an automated transport hub, which means that you don't have restrictions on how far things can be transported in six hours or 12 hours. I think that you, we, we need to kind of think through that a bit more. And I think, I think we are, you know, the, 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 the industrial revolution we're, we're living through makes it incredibly difficult to project where things are going to go. And unfortunately, maybe retail is just suffering at the forefront of that. Um, I've got, the, I mean, interestingly, there's a number of questions coming in about residential, uh, which picks up the, the theme that residential and a lot of the things around um, living are a hot topic at the moment. This one specifically about our investors, both domestic and, investor, and, and international investors, comfortable with the UK's capacity to create resi investment product that people choose to live in and can we manage it well? So is there a genuine resi product here now that international investors have a faith in? Um, no, I mean, as a business, we don't per se invest in residential, but we do student accommodation. I think, you know, PRS and BTR in the UK is, is pretty much a, an evolved model of student, albeit with um, additional bells and whistles. And I mean, I think the fundamental issue at the moment probably is that it's the operational piece um, and having scale. If you want these BTR or PRS uh, schemes to run efficiently and get your net income high, then you need to run a very large scale model, um, you know, minimum 500 units, I'd say, um, in any given location. But on that basis, you need a, you need the operational piece, which it's in its infancy to a certain extent. Um, you know, it will come as more funds, LNG, MG invest and expand their, their PRS um, funds. Um, but that is, in my opinion, the critical issue at the moment is how you run that operational model. My concern for the some of maybe the first movers is is that lack of evidence, the, the lack of knowledge of exactly how things will stack up in the UK versus how they have stacked up in other markets where there might be that that track record. I don't think operators fully know 
what the premium you can expect from a build to rent product over the whole of the PRS market is in different markets yet. I think there's still a period where we're sort of exploring that. We're exploring how the gross to net yields work across different size projects, where the critical mass is, how much scale you do need. And I think that there will be, there will be successful operators probably out there already. Um, there might be some who were amongst the first movers who, who hit some, some bumps in the road. But I think there are issues that will be, will be worked through over the coming years as we have more of the stock up and operating. And uh, pretty quickly it will provide that data that will make that a sustainable sector for the UK. Yeah, Rob, and then... Um, yeah, just yeah, um, I mean, we are doing um, residential in the UK, um, both within our value add fund and and actually for, for, for Mitsubishi. Um, it's really on the back of what we've been doing in, in Europe where actually there is a sustainable and your know, core investor market for actually relatively modest sized units, but it's all brand new. So we are forward purchasing, forward funding, um, very efficiently built, um, very affordable residential. We, we tend to avoid high end. It tends to be one, two bedroom apartments um, at the your entry level and, and, and we like that and investors seem to like that so we are we are selling to um, international core funds who, who want to do that I, I don't know whether there's a bit of a mystique about it. it's an operational business it's it's no different to having an office building it's just got 200 individuals rather than that yes you need to proper proper management and it needs to be efficient but that's no different to any other sector there is a bit of a mystique it's not the same as care homes and you, where you're actually, or even a hotel management contract, it's. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's. It's. You. It's not. Um, it's not so complicated. And I think. I think maybe the UK market thinks that yields should be higher because of that complication across Europe. Your prime residential yields to, you know, on market rents are at about three and a half percent. Yeah, and I, I was just going to take a step back. You know, the fact is, in most of our urban locations, there is not enough housing. So whilst we might fiddle around the edges at what size is the, is, uh, the apartment, how many bedrooms, does it have two bathrooms, does it have the extra amenities, I think that's slightly gilding the lily. We need more residential in, in the UK. Um, I think the, the growth of the um, build-to-rent market is a fantastic way um, for the whole ecosystem of people wanting to occupy and invest in that, to grow that finally. I mean, I think it's a big piece that we've been missing in the UK to be able to institutionalize this. Um, there might be some winners and losers, but I expect there'll be more winners actually, because I think it's a very well demanded product. Um, we can learn a lot from international um, partners as to how they've delivered it in their regions. And I think most of it will be right sized, probably get the economic fundamentals right and the, probably the biggest risk is the race for land you know can you know you have to buy at low yields to be able to afford the land against other um, high value uses and and that the BTR market and I think some of the UK domestic funds that doesn't have the carry costs that perhaps some of the internationals have been able to access point that point and get really lovely long-term income for their investors who exactly want long-term resilient income. So I, I think that from a macro level is how I see the, the resi mark in the UK. I mean, this is just a question for anyone from, from the investment side, really. Um, is in, in terms of when you're looking at cities, are you looking at, I, I love Liverpool, I love Belfast, therefore I must invest there? Or are you looking at <laughs> primarily, these are the opportunities there, are you looking at the fundamentals in terms of uh, innovation in terms of um, growth in workers. Um, I suppose, what are you looking at? What makes it attractive? And, and do the cities do enough um, in order to make it easy for you? How does that compare with dealing with European cities, let, let's say, for example, continental European cities? I don't run a domestic only fund, so I feel a little like maybe there's other people on the panel to comment, but maybe European cities versus UK cities, I can take an angle on that. Um, I actually think UK cities are great at promoting themselves. I, I visit all the stands and I, and I, I meet a lot of the counterparts um, and uh, I'm very encouraged with the high quality presentation of what uh, UK cities can offer and I think with the extra injection of improved infrastructure in a lot of our cities I think that's a for me a, as a global real estate investor one of the big ticks that I would definitely uh, invest around in terms of selecting which city I feel the UK fund might answer that better. <laughs> 
Um, we'll look across all geographies, really, and, and sectors across the UK. Um, you know, but it also it, it's kind of dependent on what we're holding at that point in time uh, and our appetite for risk to a certain extent. Um, you know, would we buy long dated income in in Birmingham? Yes, but if it was uh, a multi let building in Birmingham versus a multi let building in London, I'd buy the London asset um, simply because we always refer back to liquidity in our in our open ended fund. Um, that doesn't mean that other parties or investors won't look at those cities and they offer a lot. Um, you know, but I think you have to avoid that, which is. Oh, quite often occurring in the property industry where it's a kind of sheep mentality and we we read all the um the research papers and, and we and we follow each other into markets that we don't necessarily fully understand um and you need to really understand the demographics of those cities um you know where are the occupational demand coming from where is the cbd or are you better going fringe or you you can often come unstuck by taking a london because you sit in London and, and, and invest in London and, and take that London mentality and apply it to the regions, you can quite often get your um, your investment criteria wrong. Yes, so um, adding to what Robin said earlier, actually, it's more for us about thinking about themes and how they apply across cities. So it wouldn't be picking city A over city B. It's looking at different things that that we like as, as bigger trends and seeing how individual cities play into that. I also think it's important for, for cities not to try and be all things to all people. You know, different cities have different strengths, they have different characters, and they they should play to those rather than trying to be all things to all people. I mean, will every every city you talk to will tell you about how innovative they are and how their, their tech sector is is growing. But but what I uh, but what I what I liked actually about today's two presentations were that they went a bit further than that. In Belfast, we heard about fintech, and in Liverpool, we heard about AI. You know, it's it's finding your niche, finding what your infrastructure is supporting, and really going for those areas rather than spreading yourself too thinly. And maybe picking up on the the educational point, we you, we across Europe look at you know, cities which are probably growing faster than average, which are growing probably faster than. The rest of the country, I think there is again a, a lot of education to be done with international investors. They think the population in Germany probably is falling, but actually some of the cities in Germany are growing very fast. And, and that's pretty true of, of areas of the UK. Um, um, university um, retention rates within their cities, places like Manchester, where we have just forward purchased a 44 storey residential building. It was actually built for sale, but actually the developer has got two other buildings he needed to fund. So we're actually doing it as, as PRS. And actually we bought it in February. It's over 50% let already. Actually, interestingly enough, um, they want to let it furnished. They don't want to put their own furniture in. The, the, the millennials basically want as little effort as possible and they, they're, they're renting up. We bought it at a good price, which meant we can rent it at an affordable level. And and so some of what we do is, you are not buying the standing investment. We're, we're we're creating that standing investment, but being able to rent it at something which is a sensible rent, not something which is you know, stretching the you know, the imagination of people. Um, and Tom, from from your perspective, when you're looking at the stats of who's in, in, investing where in what cities, um, are you seeing any particular trends um, in terms, particularly looking at the UK? Whether that's there's more capital coming into London, there's more going into Edinburgh, Belfast, yeah. Liverpool. Oh, look, I mean, uh, it's a perennial truth that London London sort of dominates the UK market in terms of volumes and deal flow and price growth. Um, it's around 50% of the market, but that makes the UK less centralised than a market like France, for example, where Paris accounts for... 70 75 percent of annual investment so the market's less you know less centralized than somewhere like france less decentralized if you, if i can put it that way than somewhere like germany where you've got some very strong regional hubs but you know the, the regional market the regional big six markets are all very strong markets in their own in their own right you know places like uh, manchester and birmingham can compete with other international markets in terms of the levels of liquidity they offer and that's very important for an international investor's perspective i think the the one thing that we see uh, that maybe not holds back, but is just is a is a I guess a fact of life, and this feeds into some of what Robin was saying, is that um, international capital and some of the money that's coming in from the Far East, for example, is very focused on deploying a lot of capital in a shortish space of time. So they want large lot sizes, 
and there's a limit to how many big buildings there are in Leeds and Manchester and Edinburgh. Most of the lot sizes are under 100, 100 million, you know, under 50 million, I guess, would be, a, would be an average lot size for an office in some of these markets. So that holds back some of the investment. So some of that capital can come in and maybe be deployed in terms of a portfolio investment because then you're buying multiple buildings. But, you know, the German, invest German funds have always been big investors in, into the UK regions. We've seen, you know, a German uh, medical pension fund bought a large building recently in Edinburgh. I was in Paris last week speaking to some of our French clients and, and one of them is looking very seriously at buying in the UK at the moment because they think long term there's a buying opportunity here because continental Europe is so crowded and the markets are very expensive there. So yeah, I mean there's a cross section really Richard. Okay, good. Um, I'm aware that we're now gone slightly past our time. So has anybody got any questions that they wanted to ask? If so, I'm going to... Yes, go ahead. <coughs> just, just one qu quick one. You've got a clean whiteboard, no B-word, no political shenanigans. <laughs> what would you want to see government do? <laughs> I'm not in the market, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Straight away, just because what I've speaking to people, uh, reform the planning system. I think make it easier to get development planning through is something that I've heard time and time again come up. And speaking to the the investor, I was, the same guy I was talking to in France was saying that they've heard all sorts of nightmare stories about the UK planning system. So planning, I guess. Anyone else have a view on that? Maybe for the sake for the sake of the retailers, I'd say some reform to business rates. When we look at. Uh, occupancy cost ratios across Europe, they do, they do stand out in the UK and that is one of the reasons. Uh,